So today we're kicking off our oral pharmaceuticals event with one of the most brilliant people in anterior segment disease, Dr. Nate Lighthizer. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Nate Lighthizer was born and raised in Bismarck, North Dakota, and he's a graduate of Pacific University College of Optometry. After he graduated, he completed his residency in family practice with an emphasis in ocular disease through the Northeastern State University, Oklahoma College of Optometry. He has since joined the faculty and now serves as the chief of specialty, eye, specialty care clinics and the chief of electrodiagnostics. He also founded and heads up the dry eye clinic at the College of Optometry. And in 2020, he was named the associate dean of the NSU Oklahoma College of Optometry. He's a founding member and currently serves as president of the Intrepid Eye Society, which is a group of emerging thought leaders in optometry, one of uh, my favorite societies and incredible doctors in this group. Thank you so much, Dr. Lighthizer, and welcome to Wu Yu. Thank you, Dr. Wu. I appreciate it very much. Good morning, everybody. It is my pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, as Steph said, Dr. Nate Lighthizer, faculty member at the Oklahoma College of Optometry. Uh, and just it was a pleasure to receive the email from Dr. Wu, the invitation for this oral pharmaceuticals lecture. And again, my pleasure to be here. And I'm looking forward to for the next hour and 40 minutes where we talk on oral pharmaceuticals uh, in anterior segment disease. I want to keep this as interactive uh, as possible. As she said, if there's any questions, comments, thoughts, pearls, please feel free to share them via the chat box uh, or the Q&A box, and we will get to those again halfway through uh, and at the end of this lecture as well. So again, I've been at the Oklahoma College of Optometry for about 13 years now. So I did my residency, was fortunate enough, my wife and I, my wife is an OD as well, um, stayed on faculty, and we've been faculty members for about the last dozen or eight years or so uh, here in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. So you know, we have a very uh, nice scope of practice in Oklahoma. Oral pharmaceuticals are included, as they are uh, in nearly every state now at this point. So we're going to really hone in on oral pharmaceuticals uh, in anterior segment disease. You know, when as it comes to optometry, I think we do topicals very, very, very well. When somebody needs a topical medication, an eye drop of some sort, I think the vast majority of us, if not all of us, we don't hesitate and we'll prescribe that eye drop for glaucoma, for a for a for dry eye for a corneal ulcer whatever it is oral pharmaceuticals we do that very well as well um but i think there's more of us that may hesitate just a bit okay we've now got an oral medication what do i need to be worried about from a systemic perspective etc cetera, etc cetera. so we're going to cover the most common oral pharmaceuticals that we as optometrists use in anterior segment disease. My disclosures there, we will keep this within the guideline. There's really no companies involved in oral pharmaceuticals uh, at this point. If you've been to my, uh, my lectures before, you know I like to pull the audience. So everybody grab their phone or you open up a, a browser on your computer, your tablet, your phone, uh, and type in pollev.com forward slash my name. So normally I pull the audience we can do this in person. Obviously, we're not in person right now, but we can do this virtually as well. So open up a browser. It's on your phone. You type in, go into Safari, Google Chrome, whatever your internet browser is, and directly type in pollev.com forward slash my name, Nate Lighthizer. That will bring up my Poll Everywhere page. As we go throughout this lecture, I'm going to ask you a variety of questions. What do you think the diagnosis is? How would you treat this patient? And nobody likes to raise their hand in person or virtually offer their, their answer. So this is a completely anonymous way to poll the audience. Nobody will know what you put. I won't even know what you put. But what's nice is you can see what the group think is. What percent put A versus B versus C versus D? There's no individual answers, but you can see how the group is thinking on their most commonly used antibiotic for this condition, an antiviral for this condition, whatever it is. So type in poll ev dot com forward slash Nate Lighthizer. You don't have to download any app or anything like that. And that should bring up my poll everywhere page. And I've got an intro question. So I always start with an intro question. You can see here, here's the intro. Woo University rocks is awesome, is the best or all of the above. And look, we've already had 150 of you respond. That is cool. I've, I was told we had like 530 register for this webinar. That is so cool. So we've got a great uh, a great audience here and a great 
uh, amount of responses, nearly 200 responses. And then what's cool is I get to hit the button and there you go. You can see the answers of what the group is thinking. Woo University rocks. So there you go, Steph. Uh, you're all sorts of awesome. So I always like to show pictures of my kids at the start. There's Addie and Camden. Again, my wife and I are both ODs uh, down here in Tahlequah. Addie is 10. Camden is seven. So it's probably time for an updated picture, don't you think? Uh, 10 and seven, there's Addie and Camden. There we were at Disney World a couple of years ago pre-COVID. I thought I made a great Mickey. What do you think? Don't I think make, make a great Mickey? I thought so. No, that's not me. Just that's a Mickey there. But great great time with the great with great kids there. Uh, born and raised in North Dakota. I always show a picture of North Dakota. This is out, out of my parents' living room window from a couple of Christmases ago. 120 inches of snow there uh, at that point. Unbelievable uh, in terms of that. How many of you think, man, that looks awesome. That looks fun. How many of you think, man, that looks kind of disgusting and I would never want to do that uh, at all. So there you go. I just wanted to show the picture that that was interesting. One other picture before we get going. You know, you can get CE in a lot of different places. I'm sure some of you have been on cruises and got CE. Some of you have probably went to Europe. You go all to, all over the world, you can get CE. I was lecturing. I'm a big golfer. I played college golf. And there was a golf CE meeting before COVID. And it was in the clubhouse of Harbor Town and Hilton Head. And a group of golfers, you know, they had CE in the morning and then they went and played Harbor Town. They went and played Hilton Head on back to back days. Anybody like to fish in this audience? Anybody like to fish? You know, and and I've, I'd never heard of a fishing trip CE before until I got contacted by a group of optometrists in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And this this they go up to a lake in Ontario every year. It's called Eagle Lake Island Lodge, and they fish for like six straight days in July. And then they come in in the evening, every evening, and they have like two to three hours of CE for like four or five days in a row. I was asked to give 12 hours of CE over the course of like three or four days. Uh, and it was just a great, great trip. And I got to catch this. And what do you think that is? Yeah, it's a fish. Absolutely. That is a fish. Nice one uh, there. That's a fish. Um, that is a 42 inch musky, which is not even a great big uh, fish. That's like a medium sized musky. The biggest one that week by the optometrist was a 54 inch uh, musky, which is just incredible. Four and a half feet long right there. I went back a couple of years later and, and, and spoke again, brought my dad and here's him with a 47 inch uh, musky. So if you like to fish, and you got to get CE, you should check out this fishing trip through the Wisconsin uh, Association. A guy named Dean Springer, he's an optometrist and a pro fisherman. Uh, I'm not affiliated with the conference whatsoever, have no financial ties to it, but I just thought you'd enjoy those pictures uh, as we get kicked off here. So here we go. We're going to kick off on oral pharmaceuticals. So again, I want to keep this very, very interactive. I'm going to ask you a variety of questions as we go throughout this lecture. So case number two, I switched the cases around just a bit. So I wanted to change up the order. So case number two was a patient that I saw on Monday evening at 10 p.m. And you say, wow, Monday evening at 10 p.m.? You keep odd hours, uh, Nate. This was during my residency. You guys may or may not be familiar with the Oklahoma College of Optometry. We sit in the northeast corner of Oklahoma in a little town called Tahlequah, Oklahoma, a town about 20,000. We're an hour to the east of Tulsa. We're an hour to the west of Fayetteville, Arkansas, which is where the University of Arkansas is. Uh, so we're kind of right in between in what's called green country in the northeast corner of Oklahoma. It's at the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. I was never in Oklahoma until I got there for my residency back in 2009. And in Northeast Oklahoma isn't what you'd think in terms of Oklahoma. You know, the wind sweeping across the plains. Uh, we're at the foothills of the Ozark Mountains. Well, we're in the capital city of Cherokee Nation. We serve Cherokee Nation. We're the official eye care provider of Cherokee Nation, the Oklahoma College of Optometry. And it's been that way for now 43 years. We've had a partnership with Cherokee Nation. We have 11 locations and we offer our services to all of their patients. And we're in our own little bubble of socialized medicine. Their patients don't pay for anything. We bill insurance, um, but if patients don't have insurance, uh, they don't have to pay for medications. Um, because Cherokee Nation will cover any costs above and beyond what insurance doesn't cover. So we're in our own little bubble of socialized medicine. So as you can imagine, we see a ton of patients. We have long wait lists 
uh, because there is no cost. Patients don't pay for medications. In our dry eye clinic, we have Lodamax at no cost and Restasis or Sequa or Zydra at no cost because Cherokee Nation has their own formulary. Our residents, I'm, I have a, where I'm going with this is our residents, when I was a resident, and our residents currently will take call from 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next morning and on weekends. So after business hours, our residents, our optometry residents, we typically have five or six of them. We They take call. They split call. So I was on call about one week every month or so uh, taking call. So this was my last week of on call. And I'll tell you, when you remove the cost of having to go into the urgent care or ER, many more patients utilize those services. Our residents on average see between about 10 and 15 patients per week while on call. Can you imagine seeing 10 to 15 patients over the course of the next week, starting tomorrow through the next Monday, seeing 10 to 15 patients after hours on top of your normal workload, okay? You've got a patient on Monday at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. You got a patient on Tuesday at 6 p.m. You got a patient on Wednesday at midnight. And then usually on the Saturday and Sunday, they see three to four patients a day. By the end of your residency, you're worn out from on call. It's a great experience. I grew tremendously from it, but this was my last week on call. My last week on call as a resident. So I'm so ready to be done with on call. But the phone rings at 10 p.m. on Monday evening and the urgent care, the triage nurse says, hey, we've got a patient here. And she's got a pretty significantly swollen eyelid. We need you to come in and see this patient. I said, no problem. Uh, I'll come on in and, and I'll see this patient. So when you're evaluating a patient that has an eyelid that looks like this, and this was the patient. This is the photo that I took. And obviously, this is a significantly swollen right upper lid. The lower lid does not appear to be involved. The left eye is not involved whatsoever. What would be your first question when you're speaking with this patient? And I think it's really the first question whether they've got vision loss, their, their vision is down, they've got a floater, they've got a red eye, they've got a swollen eyelid, something is new. The first question is going to be what? How long has this been going on? And that was the question, you know, how long has this been going on? Remember, this is Monday evening, about 10 p.m. And she said, you know, this started on Friday afternoon. You know, Friday afternoon, I started to notice that, you know, I just, I could feel a little, like a little tenderness and my, I was getting a little warmth up here. It was, it was tender. It was starting to get swollen. So this started on Friday afternoon. And over the course of Friday evening into Saturday, into Sunday, into Monday, remember this is now Monday evening at 10 p.m., this got worse and worse and more swollen and more red and more painful. She's in 10 out of 10 pain. When I walked in to see her, she was sitting in a chair, okay? And she was doubled over just like this. And she was, she just, I remember she had a, a cold pack over this right eye and I remember I called her name and she looked up at me like this and she said, doctor, will you just stick a needle in this and drain whatever this is? And I remember chuckling and going, no, I can't even see what because it's covered up right now. I'm not going to stick a needle uh, in whatever this is at this point in time. So I walked her down to the exam room and this thing was so swollen that she couldn't really open her eye. However, if she tipped her head back and opened both eyes as wide as possible, I could just see a sliver of the globe. But it was enough in this right eye to check her visual acuity. Her visual acuity was 2030 in the right eye, 2020 in the uninvolved left eye. So actually vision was relatively good in this right eye. Her eye was just barely open, but it was enough to check visual acuity. It was enough to check pupils. I was able to go back and forth and back and forth there was pupils, there was no pupillary involvement. The pupils were normal, no APD. She could look up, she could look down, she could look left, she could look right. We could reliably assess extraocular motility. The EOMs were normal and there was minimal to no pain on EOMs as well. By the way, it did not appear that she was proptotic. So that's good at this point in time that we've got relatively good vision. The pupils are normal. The EOMs are normal, minimal to no pain on EOMs. It doesn't appear she's proptotic. So these are all good signs. Frankly, the globe looked uninvolved in this right eye. Globe looked uninvolved. So I was very happy. This just appeared to be an eyelid thing. Oh, by the way, the triage nurse 
the nurse, the doctor sometimes gets involved before we get in there, but they do a couple of things while we're, you know, driving from our house towards the ER, you know, it takes 15 to 20 minutes from when you get the phone call to when you get into the urgent care, they checked her temperature. She did not have a fever. She was 98 point whatever temperature. So no fever at this point in time. So that is good at this point. You know, is there anything else that you would want to know at this point? I think we covered most everything. No fever. You know, other questions we asked, have you been bitten by anything? You know, do you remember getting bitten by a bug? We looked at her eyelid. There didn't appear to be any focal redness or like a spot where something had bitten her. She denied being bitten by any bug or insect or anything like that. And we have that occasionally occur uh, here in Northeast Oklahoma. I had a patient a number of years ago that I was evaluating her and I noticed she has this black spot, this necrotic tissue right in the center of her forehead. It was about the size of a dime. And I remember asking her, you know, what happened? And she said, well, uh, they think I got bitten by a brown recluse spider a fiddleback spider while I was sleeping that had crawled on my forehead and bit me right there. Um, so I've had patients that have got bitten by insects. Doesn't appear in this particular case. She denied being bitten by anything and we couldn't see any evidence of that either. So here's my first question for you. Based on the clinical history and the appearance, what is your diagnosis? Polling is open. Is this an orbital cellulitis? Is this a preceptal cellulitis? Is it a lid abscess? Is it a bug bite? Is it a dacryocystitis? Or is this a dacryoadenitis? Based on the clinical history and appearance in this 23-year-old systemically healthy female, 23-year-old systemically healthy female. Uh, again, we answered a lot of the questions. She's not a contact lens wear, by the way, not a contact lens wear. This has never happened before. So this is the first incidence. It's never happened before. Pupils are normal. EOMs are normal. Uh, again, all of this is normal based on the clinical history and appearance. What is your uh, diagnosis at this point in time? I'm guessing we're going to be fairly strongly leaning towards one of these answers. And 89% of you, 90% of you are thinking preceptal cellulitis. And I would completely agree with that as well. So how have we ruled out orbital cellulitis? Well, we've got normal pupils and normal EOMs and we're not proptotic and there is no fever. Oh, by the way, the triage nurse was so freaked out about how swollen this looks. She calls the doctor in before I get there and they said, let's get a CT scan. So when I walked into the ER, they were just completing a CT scan on this patient and the CT scan was normal. It showed no orbital involvement at this point. So that was another layer of evidence that made me feel good that this was not an orbital cellulitis. Again, a lid abscess, that's a kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. That's relatively rare. You're going to rule out other things first. We do see one or two lid abscesses every year, but again, I wouldn't go to that as your first diagnosis. A bug bite, didn't see any evidence of that, and she denied that. Why is this not a dacryocystitis? It's in the wrong location, isn't it? And the location, 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 a dacryocystitis is an infection of the lacrimal sac. So it's going to be inferior nasal down here. And a dacryoadenitis is, is a relatively rare infection inflammation of the lacrimal gland, which can be the upper lid, often outer here. Infection, inflammation of the lacrimal gland. I always tell our students when I'm teaching anterior segment disease, horses versus zebras. Think more common horses versus less common zebras. Dacryoadenitis is really a zebra. So I would 100% agree this looks like a preceptal cellulitis. So this is a prescribing orals lecture. So I'm going to ask you guys, what would you start this patient on? If this was your patient that you just diagnosed a fairly significant, a fairly severe preceptal cellulitis, what would you start this patient on? amoxicillin clavulinate, which is augmentin, 500 milligrams three times a day, or we could say 875 twice a day. Bactrim, double strength. Keflex, 500 milligrams three or four times a day. A Z-Pack, doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day. Vigamox or something else. Polling is open once again. And again, this is completely anonymous. Nobody knows what, you're, what you put. I won't even know what you put. But I just like to poll you know, a group of, you know, 200 optometrists. Let's see what the standard of care is in this chat, in this webinar, 
What do we think? What would you guys start the patient on? And there's really multiple correct answers here. There's more than one correct answer in this. All right, we've had close to 200 of you respond here. And I love the answers. There it is. So you can see what your colleagues are leaning for or, or towards. I would say there's a, you know really about four correct answers uh, here. My number one would be augmentin. Amoxicillin clavulinate, 500 milligrams three times a day or 875 twice a day. Your number one is my number one. Your number two is my number two, Keflex. Those are my top two, augmentin and Keflex nice options. And you can see about 84% of you, 83% of you are putting one of those two answers. Other correct answers. I don't think Bactrim is wrong. I think that's a nice option. Doxycycline, hundred milligrams twice a day. I don't think that's wrong either. Doxycycline, hundred milligrams twice a day. Um, that's the anti-infective dose. Is it what I would reach to first or second or third? Probably not, but I think it's an option as well. The only one that, you know, maybe is interesting, about 8% of you put azithromycin or a Z pack. I used to check that as a correct answer. I don't think it's necessarily a, a totally incorrect answer, but for reasons that I'm going to get to in just a bit, talking about the armor data. What is the armor data? Antimicrobial resistance monitoring in ocular microorganisms. The armor data gave us information on how likely are these drugs going to work against these bugs. And we'll get there on azithromycin is not great against regular staff anymore. So again, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's maybe not the top three or four answers that I would go to. Again, top two clear in these uh, with this group here. So let's go back to the case. You know, what did we do in this particular case? How did I treat this patient? Again, I diagnosed a severe preceptal cellulitis at this point in time. I changed the case just a bit because I wanted you guys to answer this question. I wanted you guys to answer, what would you put this patient on? When I saw this patient, I saw her on Monday evening at 10 p.m. She actually came in to a different ER within Cherokee Nation on Sunday night. So on Sunday night, this was bad enough on Sunday night that she went to a very rural ER urgent care in Cherokee Nation and saw a different uh, provider, saw an urgent care or an ER doctor, not an optometrist, not an opth ophthalmologist, saw an or ER or urgent care provider, and they started her on Bactrim. So she was on an oral antibiotic, Bactrim double strength. She started that on Sunday evening, and the ER physician on Sunday night was so freaked out by how swollen and red and tender and painful this was that they gave her a shot of an intramuscular cephalosporin in the buttocks. So on Sunday evening, she was started on an oral medication, Bactrim, and she was giving a shot of intramuscular antibiotic on Sunday night. Fast forward to Monday, the ER physician, the triage nurse, before I got in there, they took her temperature. Thank you. They did a CT scan. I appreciate having that CT results. That made me feel good that this was not orbital cellulitis. They also were so freaked out about this that they gave her a second shot of an intramuscular antibiotic. So by the time that I walked in and evaluated this patient, she's on an oral medication, Bactrim, and she's had two shots of intramuscular antibiotics. So what am I going to do at this point? I'm going to give this time at this point is really all I'm going to do is I'm going to give this some time, let the antibiotics kick in. The only prescription narcotic that we had at this point was Tylenol-3 in our system. So I gave her a few Tylenol-3 because she was in 10 out of 10 pain. There was significant warmth to this. This was very, very painful. Again, 10 out of 10. And I'll tell you, when I hear 10 out of 10 from the female gender, that hits home to me because they are way tougher than when I hear 10 out of 10 from a young male, they're wusses. And I can say that as a member of the male gender, but 10 out of 10 pain. So I gave her a few Tylenol three and I said, we just need to let the antibiotics kick in at this point in time. I'm going to see you late tomorrow, late to Tuesday afternoon, and we'll see how this is doing. So we discharged her and I saw her on Tuesday afternoon late to like four, four thirty, And she said, doctor, this is no worse but there is no improvement at all at this point. It is no better. Still 10 out of 10 pain, swelling, tenderness. This hurts. This is no better at this point. So I'm starting to scratch my head on Tuesday afternoon going, okay, it's not an orbital cellulitis. There's no fever. 
CT scan was normal, pro no proptosis, no pain in EOMs, no, you know, things. It looked fine in terms of no, uh, orbital cellulitis. If this is a preceptal cellulitis, this should be getting better. I said, okay, you've been on antibiotics for 48 hours. Let's give it one more day. Come back on Wednesday afternoon. And if this is not better by Wednesday afternoon, nearly 72 hours into oral antibiotics and the shots of antibiotics, we're going to need to reconsider our diagnosis. So on Wednesday afternoon, she comes in. I told her to come to our university clinic where our surgeon was located. And I said, I want him you to come over here and we'll evaluate. And we may need to look at, is this one of those one or two cases of an eyelid abscess that we see every year? So she comes to our university clinic on Wednesday afternoon and she says, it's no worse, but it's no better at all. There is no clinical improvement at this point in time. 10 out of 10 pain, significant swelling, significant redness, significant warmth. So I brought our surgeon in and I said, hey, we've been on Bactrim double strength since Sunday afternoon, early evening. She's had two shots of intramuscular cephalosporin with no clinical improvement from Sunday to Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday. I said, what do you think? It's not orbital cellulitis. I showed him the CT scan and he agreed. He goes, yep, it's not orbital cellulitis. Preceptal should be getting better. So on Wednesday, June 30th, I got to assist our surgeon, this is my last day of residency, I got to assist our surgeon in draining this eyelid abscess. And I'll tell you, can you imagine this tissue that's infected, it's inflamed, it's necrotic. When he stuck that needle into this tissue, she screamed unlike anything I'd ever heard before. She howled and howled and howled. She, I mean, it was unbelievable. It took close to 10 minutes to get her numb. This tissue becomes acidotic. It doesn't take up anesthetic as well, and it can take longer to numb them up. So it was just unbelievable watching, having to numb this up. You know, I stick needles and eyelids all the time here in Oklahoma. We do lump and bump removal, chalazian removal, et cetera, et cetera. But that tissue isn't infected. That tissue isn't overly inflamed and red. So they're not going to, you know, scream in, in severe pain for most patients. You stick a needle in this tissue and that's going to be significantly tender and significantly painful for many patients there. Finally, she's numb and you make a little incision. And when, when you make an incision into an abscess, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to all this cheesy stuff. And when our surgeon made an incision into that abscess, this exploded and hit him right in the head. I'm kidding. Totally joking. I'm just got to make you chuckle a little bit there. That, totally joking. It did not do that. But he makes an incision and some cheesy stuff came out. Some gooey stuff came out of this. Um, and he had to squeeze a little bit and got a little bit more cheesy stuff and it bled. Um, and you got some of this stuff out. But it wasn't as much gooey stuff and cheesy stuff as I figured enough pussy stuff as I thought it would be. Um, but eventually we got most of that stuff out. Came in, you know, came out like with little pockets of tissue. He was picking out pockets of tissue, looked like granulated tissue, but eventually got a bunch of this drained, this eyelid abscess drained. And when it was mostly drained, it was like a hollow eyelid then with getting all of this junk out. And I remember our surgeon took betadine, took betadine 5% ophthalmic betadine, and he squirted a little bit inside the wound just for it to contact and kill whatever was growing in this eyelid abscess. He let he let that stay in there for you know a minute or so, and then flushed all of that out. So he did kind of a betadine lavage, a betadine flush inside the wound, and then he tucked uh, what's called iodoform gauze or betadine soaked gauze inside the wound, covered it up with a bunch of ointment, patched her up and said, we'll see you on Friday afternoon. And two days from now, we've drained this eyelid abscess. We cultured, okay, we cultured uh, what was growing on this. Let's see what's growing. And on that Wednesday, we took her off of Bactrim and we put her on your favorite. We put her on my favorite oral antibiotic, which is Augmentin uh, at that point, a little bit more broad spectrum antibiotic. So took her off of Bactrim, took, put her back on or put her on Augmentin and said, we'll see you back in a couple of days for follow-up. Two days later on Friday afternoon, the culture was not back yet on Friday afternoon. So we didn't know what this was yet on Friday, but she walked in with a smile on her face for the first time. For the first time, she has got a smile on her face. And again, she's patched up. So she can't see it. I can't see it, but she goes, it feels much better. 
The pain is subsiding. The pain is much better. It just feels better. We took the patch off. The redness is improving. The swelling is improving. The tenderness is improving. Pulled out the iodoform gauze, flushed the wound out, cleaned everything up, uh, and it's looking much, much better. Culture was not back on Friday, so we said, let's come in on Monday. We'll give it the weekend. Anything worsens, let us know. You come in sooner. Here's our number. Call us if anything changes. But this should continue to progress and get better and get better and get better. Over the weekend, we'll see you Monday afternoon. Monday afternoon, the culture came back. What do you think this grew? Which, I'm going to take a sip so you guys can think on that. Which bacteria? So we know that. Like 95 to 96 percent of the bugs on the eyelids are gram positive. The vast majority of them are gram positive. Remember that. You know, when you think of what's the most common bug that we deal with, the most common bacteria that we deal with in a contact lens related corneal ulcer, we all know the answer to that, don't we? It's pseudomonas which is gram negative, a contact lens related corneal ulcer, pseudomonas, it's gram negative, but that's on the cornea. That's contact lens related. That's different. This is on the eyelids and the vast majority of bugs are gram positive. This was a case of staph. Let me be more specific. This was methicillin resistant staph aureus. This patient had a MRSA eyelid abscess. So on Monday, we took her off augmentin and we put her on the oral of choice for MRSA. If you ever have to battle MRSA in the eyelid and it requires an oral antibiotic, your oral of choice, unless there's any contraindications, but your oral of choice is Bactrim. And we'll get into why in just a second. So that is your number one oral. If you ever have to prescribe an oral for a MRSA in this area, it is going to be Bactrim, which is the combination of sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. And we'll get into that more in just a second. So we put her on Bactrim on Monday and this resolved nicely, this case of a MRSA eyelid abscess. So how did we differentiate in this particular case, the eyelid abscess versus the preceptal cellulitis? Again, we went through all of this already. We checked pupils, we checked EOMs, any pain on EOMs, fever was checked. There was no fever. You could go to a CT scan if you were really uh, you know, trying to, dis to differentiate between the two. But usually pupils, is there any proptosis, EOMs, pain on EOMs, fever, that's going to be your differential. In this case, they were all normal, which made us lean towards preceptal cellulitis versus orbital cellulitis, where they often can be proptotic where they can have a restriction of EOMs, significant pain in EOMs, pupils may be involved, and they often have a fever in orbital cellulitis there. So let's talk with oral antibiotics. You know, this is my oral antibiotic paradigm. When I think of prescribing oral antibiotics, this is what I think of in my mind, this slide going, okay, we've got a preceptal cellulitis, or we've got an internal hordeolum, or we've got a dacryocystitis. We've got a condition that necessitates an oral antibiotic for killing bacteria. This is what I think of. Now, notice there's a class of antibiotics in here that I didn't list. And that class is the tetracyclines. We've got a class, the tetracyclines that are composed of tetracycline, doxycycline, minocycline. They are oral antibiotics. So you could put them in here, but more often than not, we use doxycycline or minocycline for what? Not its antibiotic effects, but its anti-inflammatory effects. We're using doxycycline for meibomian gland dysfunction or for ocular rosacea, things like that. And we're not killing bacteria. Do remember that doxycycline, the, the, the anti-infective dose is 100 milligrams twice a day. Usually we use this 50 milligrams once or twice a day, which is subclinical for killing bacteria. When it comes to doxycycline, we're inhibiting bacterial lipases, we're lowering the melting point of mybum, and we're using doxycycline for its anti-inflammatory effects. Again, 50 milligrams once or twice a day for a month or two for MGD rosacea, maybe longer in some cases as well. So that's why I didn't put the tetracyclines on here, is this is my oral antibiotic paradigm for killing bacteria. We've got an infection, whether it's a preceptal, a hordeolum or something else, and we need to wipe out the bacteria. So here's my oral antibiotic paradigm, and we're gonna go through this here in just a second. So I wanna encourage you guys to prescribe oral antibiotics when they are needed. Don't hesitate. We do topicals very well. We're gonna do orals very well as well. If they need an oral antibiotic for whatever reason, prescribe it. But don't over-prescribe it. 
Just because a patient has sinus issues or a, has pain in this area and a sinus infection doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bacterial sinus infection. We all know we have a resistance problem. They're, the more and more these bugs get access to these drugs, they're smart. They figure them out and they start to develop resistance to these antibiotics. So uh, the take-home point on this slide is the Infectious Disease Society of America has now recommended for the last decade or so, when you prescribe oral antibiotics, when you prescribe one of these, five to seven days is enough. You don't, prescribing for 10 days or two weeks is too long. We don't need that in adults. Now in kids, you can go to that. In kids, you can do that. But in adults, five to seven days is really enough. And that's what the Infectious Disease Society of America recommends. To me, seven days is the sweet spot. Five days doesn't seem quite long enough unless it's a Z-Pack. But seven days uh, is, is what my standard when I'm prescribing Augmentin or Keflex or Bactrim. It is a seven-day period. And if things are not getting better by seven days, we need to reconsider our diagnosis or switch to a different antibiotic. Don't just prescribing into day or continue prescribing into day 10. 14, 21, because that's when you can encourage resistance there. So I want to encourage you to prescribe, but don't over-prescribe. So here's our next question. Let's say you're battling MRSA. Let's say, we don't have to say ocular. Let's, let's Maybe it's a systemic MRSA infection. Maybe it's a corneal ulcer, whatever it is. If you or your loved one or your favorite patient has a site-threatening or a life-threatening MRSA infection, what is the absolute drug that you want them to have? The absolute best drug for MRSA is what? The absolute best drug for MRSA is what? What do you think here? Is it amoxicillin, fluoroquinolones, vancomycin, keflex, azithromycin, and trimethoprim? The Armour data showed that this medication had a 100% kill rate against MRSA. What is 100% in medicine? Nothing's 100% in medicine. This had a 100% kill rate. The absolute best drug for MRSA is vancomycin. It is vancomycin. Trimethoprim is number two. Okay. Trimethoprim is a great drug for MRSA, but vancomycin is number one. Now, what's the problem with vancomycin? We don't have a commercially available vancomycin eye drop. You can't just write on a script vancomycin. It's going to have to be a compounded eye drop. So there's not a commercially available eye drop and vancomycin orally is really not, not, a, it's not available. You can't get vancomycin. You're not going to prescribe vancomycin 500 milligrams three times a day by mouth. It just isn't available orally through the stomach. Doesn't work. So it's not available commercially as a topical. It's got to be compounded and we can't use vancomycin orally. What's the second best drug for MRSA? It's trimethoprim, which you guys got here. So vancomycin is number one, but it's not available orally. So when prescribing orally, trimethoprim is number two. And that's why Bactrim is your number one oral medication of choice for MRSA. So let's go through the armor data. Again, the antimicrobial resistance monitoring in ocular microorganisms. That is the armor study. Basically, let's take all of these bugs and all of these drugs and how likely are these drugs going to be killing these bugs? That's what it looked at here. And you can see from the 2015 data, a couple of take-home points. Trimethoprim, awesome for gram positive. Trimethoprim works very well for gram positive. It knocks out regular staff, but notice MRSA, 93% kill rate against MRSA. We're talking oral. So tri Bactrim is a great for MRSA, but let's even switch it to topicals quickly. If you ever think you're dealing with a MRSA corneal ulcer, and let's say for some reason you can't get compounded vancomycin, I can't get vancomycin. I know it's the best drug, but I can't get it. I need to go to an eye drop for for this corneal ulcer. What would be a very good eye drop to utilize something that has trimethoprim in it, which is what? Polytrim. Polytrim is a great topical antibiotic. It's great against gram negative. Polymyxin B is great against gram negative, including, including Pseudomonas. And trimethoprim is great against gram positive, including MRSA. Polytrim is a great topical antibiotic uh, against MRSA. We'll cover that more in just a second. Clindamycin, going back to the orals. 
The oral of choice is Bactrim. Bactrim is number one. Clindamycin would be number two or number three if they can tolerate. There's some GI uh, issues with clindamycin, but it has about a 70% kill rate against MRSA. Notice the floxacins, levofloxacin. It works against regular staff, but the take-home point that you'll see in the 2015 armor data and you'll see it again in the 2018 armor data, which I'm about to go through, your fourth generation fluoroquinolones, your third generation fluoroquinolones, they're great antibiotics. They're not the antibiotic of choice for MRSA. They're only killing MRSA about 20 to 25% of the time. So they're not your antibiotic of choice topically or orally if you ever think you're dealing with MRSA. Last point on this slide, why did I take a Z pack off of the correct answers when we talked about uh, that first case? Notice azithromycin, a Z pack is only working against regular staff a little under 60% of the time. It's terrible for MRSA. It does not work for MRSA, but even for regular staff, it's only working about 57% of the time. So it may not be the best antibiotic to kill gram positive. It may work for you, but it may not based on this data. So let's go again, 2015. If you were lining these up from best to worst for MRSA and for Pseudomonas, I'll start on the right here. What was the good news about the st this study in 2015? Pretty much everything's working against Pseudomonas. At a 90 plus percent clip, we've got a lot of options for Pseudomonas. So that contact lens related corneal ulcer that you are battling, Pseudomonas, it, it's being killed by fluoroquinolones. They didn't have a high enough end number for GADI, MOXIE, and Besafloxacin, but it was killing it at a high rate in those small numbers as well. Tobramycin, Polymixin B, pretty much everything is working at a 90 plus percent clip for Pseudomonas. How about MRSA? Vancomycin, 100%. Trimethoprim is doing a great job. Now, I'm going to go down to this besafloxacin here. There wasn't a high enough N number in the study to give a percentage, but do know that if there was a high enough number, the besafloxacin that was used was killing MRSA at the second best clip. It was in between vancomycin and trimethoprim, so you really can slot besafloxacin or besavance as your second best eye drop for MRSA. Again, vancomycin is number one, but it has to be compounded. But if you can't get compounded vancomycin and you want to go to number two, it is commercially available. It is besafloxacin. It is besavance is a great option as an eye drop. What's the problem orally? There is no oral version of besafloxacin. There is no oral version of besavance. So option number one, vancomycin, and option number two, Besafloxacin are not available orally, and that's why trimethoprim is your best oral of choice, Bactrim, uh, if you ever have to, to prescribe an oral for MRSA there. So we covered that. Let's switch to the 18 data. The updated data from 2018, this is the most recent armor data. And again, update those percentages from 2015. I'll give you a couple of seconds to digest this. There's really not much that's different here from 2015. Trimethoprim, keep it up. Keep doing a great job against gram positive, including MRSA, killing at a 90% rate. Clindamycin, again, it's our number two or number three oral, if you ever have to go orally. Bactrim is number one. And then doxycycline or clindamycin are number two and number three. There's Vanco still kicking butt. Notice azithromycin, only about 60% for regular staff. We covered that already. And then again, your floxacins, floxacins, floxacins. They work for regular staff, but they are not the drug of choice for MRSA, only killing at about a 20 to 25% success rate, uh, as you can see right there. Again, the good news, pretty much everything is working against pseudomonas. So pseudomonas remains very susceptible to polymyxin B, to tobramycin, to the floxacins. It's doing a great job. Summing up here uh, with our armor data, again, just listing from best to worst. I'll start again. Everything's working against pseudomonas. You've got a ton of options for pseudomonas when you're treating that corneal ulcer, likely contact lens related. When it comes to MRSA, vancomycin is number one. Besafloxacin is number two, trimethoprim is number three, and then you go on down the line from that. So again, there's our, our armor data, important to review. How well are these bugs being killed by these drugs? So let's spend a couple of minutes on the oral antibiotic paradigm. Your number one is the penicillins. 
Your number two is the cephalosporins, and that's my number one and number two as well. You talk about the penicillins. It's amoxicillin. Now, amoxicillin has been around for a long time. Amoxicillin has been around for close to 100 years at this point, close to 80 to 100 years. And bacteria has largely figured amoxicillin out. And there's a decent amount of resistance to amoxicillin. Will it work for you? It could. It could work for you, but there's a decent amount of resistance. And that's why amoxicillin is often combined with clavulonic acid, clavulinate, and that forms augmentin. I use augmentin 875 milligrams twice a day or 500 milligrams three times a day. Remember that it's dosed based on the amoxicillin. So it's 875 gram, milligrams of amoxicillin or 500 milligrams of amoxicillin three times a day. But do remember that there's a slash 125 milligrams. Augmentin 875 slash 125 is 875 milligrams of amoxicillin and 125 milligrams of clavulonic acid or clavulinate. What does clavulinate do? It's basically a sacrificial drug. It is there because bacteria have figured out amoxicillin. Bacteria have produced an enzyme. You've all heard of it, beta-lactamase. And it cleaves the amoxicillin and renders it ineffective. It, it, that's the resistance that develops. So clavulinate is in there to basically say, hey, beta-lactamase, come get me. And the beta-lactamase cleaves the clavulinate and it leaves the amoxicillin alone. So um, the, clavulonic, the clavulonic acid or the clavulinate is basically a sacrificial part of augmentin so the amoxicillin can do the killing. Again, 875 twice a day or 500 milligrams three times a day. This is your do everything. If you want to remember one drug and stop, pay attention, stop paying attention after this, this is your do everything drug. It works very well for gram negative. It works very well for gram positive. It works well in the young. It works well in the elderly. Uh, this will work for uh, gram positive, gram negative. It's very pregnancy friendly. This is your do everything drug. This will work the vast majority of the time, but there are two times when you would want to hesitate before prescribing the penicillins, before prescribing augmentin. What are they? Again, this works for most things. This is our, a great broad spectrum antibiotic, but you don't want to use it in two conditions. What are they? And number one, a true allergy. If they're truly allergic to penicillin, you obviously would not want to use a penicillin. Now, studies out there indicate that more patients think they're allergic to penicillin than are actually allergic to penicillin. What are patients confusing? They're confusing allergy with adverse events, allergy with side effects. You get a little diarrhea, a little stomach upset on an oral antibiotic. That does not mean you're allergic to it, okay? You get a rash and trouble breathing and going to anaphylactic shock. Okay, that's an allergy. But there's one study out there that shows 21% of patients say they're allergic to the penicillins. You know how many are actually allergic? Like 5 to 7%. So they're confusing side effect with allergy. So, but that's true. If it's Two reasons you don't use it. If they're truly allergic to penicillins, doc, I can't take them. I went into anaphylactic shock. I had trouble breathing, whatever it was. Okay, I'm going to shy away from the penicillins. And then the second one we've already covered. If you're ever dealing with MRSA, if you ever have feel like you're dealing with MRSA for whatever reason, did I say that augmentin or amoxicillin was a MRSA drug of choice? Nope. We will get there on the right side of this paradigm. That's your Bactrim, your trimethoprim, which we'll get there in just a second. So those are your two biggest contraindications for using augmentin would be if they're truly allergic to the penicillins or if you think you're dealing with MRSA uh, for whatever reason. Other than that, it's a great antibiotic and that's likely the reason that it's your number one and it's our number one as well. Works great for preceptal cellulitis, internal hordeolums, dacryocystitis, among other conditions as well. So there's your penicillins. We cover that first. Moving on to the cephalosporins. The cephalosporins are a cousin to the penicillins. They, they look somewhat similar, but do note it's just the first generation cephalosporins. The first generation cephalosporins, Keflex which is cephalexin, cephalexin 500 milligrams. I've heard anywhere from two to four times a day. I typically prescribe it about three times a day, 500 milligrams, three times a day of cephalexin. That is your Keflex. It's a first generation cephalosporin. Those are somewhat similar than the penicillins. And I'm sure you guys have heard, if you're allergic to the penicillins, 
you can be allergic to the cephalosporins as well. Do note that's for the first generation cephalosporins. That is for the first generation cephalosporins. You get to the second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation, the fifth generation of cephalosporins, and they don't look anything like the penicillins. It's just the early generations where there can be some cross reactivity. I was trained at it's about 10%. If you're allergic to the penicillins, there's a 10% chance you're going to be allergic to the cephalosporins. More recent data says it's probably less than that. But if your patient is truly allergic to the penicillins, I may, I said may, shy away from prescribing the cephalosporin, the first generation cephalosporins, Keflex. But this is a nice antibiotic. It has great soft tissue penetration, great coverage against gram positive. But do note, why do I put penicillins ahead of the cephalosporins, specifically Keflex? Because Augmentin is better for gram negative compared to Keflex. Keflex is not great for gram negative. Well, most of the bugs in the eyelids are gram positive. So it's largely irrelevant, but do know that Augmentin is better for gram negative than Keflex is. So that's one of the reasons why I like Augmentin a bit more. It's a little bit more broad spectrum uh, when you're you know, doing the shotgun approach, trying to kill these bacteria. So it's a great antibiotic, Keflex, amazing soft tissue penetration. It likely will take care of that preceptal cellulitis, hordeolum, et cetera, et cetera. Now, two things increase. As you go from first generation to second generation to third generation to fourth generation to fifth generation cephalosporins, two things increase. Number one is gram negative coverage. They get better for gram negative as they go through those generations. First generation cephalosporins, not great for gram negative. Third, fourth, fifth generation is much better. So gram negative coverage increases, it improves. And the other thing that improves is obviously the cost. The cost is going to get more expensive as you go to later generations of cephalosporins. You know, my daughter's 10 now. And when she was like four or five, she had a little ear infection. I remember we took her to her, her pediatrician and the pediatrician prescribed ceftibutin, which is a third generation cephalosporin. And we got to the pharmacy and they said, that'll be $952. And I remember just laughing going, uh, no, I don't think so. $952. We have insurance and they'd forgot to run the insurance. And they said, okay, that'll be $180. And I went, holy smokes, $180. Can't we find an, a different uh, option? And they did. That was much more reasonable. But the point is two things increase as you go from first to fifth generation, gram negative coverage improves. It, it increases and cost increases as well. But these two, 85% of you put a penicillin or a cephalosporin, Augmentin or Keflex, great options. They're very pregnancy friendly. They were pregnancy category B back in the day. So they're very pregnancy friendly and they're nice, nice options for the vast majority of things that we deal with. How about the macrolides? Your azithromycin, a Z pack, urethromycin, but most often it's azithromycin, clarithromycin, but most often a Z pack or a tri pack. Do remember that azithromycin has an incredibly long half life has an incredibly long half-life. That's why you only need five days of a Z-pack or three days of a tri-pack. What is a tri-pack? 500 milligrams daily for three days. What is a Z-pack? 500 milligrams on day one, and then 250, 250, 250, 250 on day two, three, four, and five. That's a Z-pack. It's only five days. That's not overly long, but there's an incredibly long half-life with azithromycin. Now, is it the best killing bacteria oral antibiotic? It's not, according to the Armour data, but do remember that azithromycin, like doxy, it's an antibiotic, but they think has some anti-inflammatory properties as well. If you're ever dealing with a hordeolum turning into a chalazion, you know, doxycycline may be a nice option there, kill some bacteria, anti-inflammatory a hordeolum turning into a schlazian and maybe doxycycline is contraindicated. You can't use doxy for one reason or the other. Know that azithromycin, a Z-pack, or even just 500 milligrams for a week of azithromycin, antibiotic, but it's got some anti-inflammatory properties out there. There's some anecdotal reports and anecdotal literature out there of azithromycin, antibiotic, maybe some anti-inflammatory properties as well. I don't usually use azithromycin, for killing bacteria, unless they're, they're really allergic to penicillins, 
and they're allergic to the sulfas. And if because they're truly allergic to the penicillins, that knocks out the penicillins. They're allergic to the sulfas, that knocks out the sulfas. They're allergic to the penicillins and they went into anaphylactic shock. I don't want to deal with the cross reactivity, the cephalosporins. Do know you could go to third generation, fourth generation, et cetera. But that may be one of the instances when they're truly allergic to the penicillins, they're truly allergic to the sulfas. I may consider a ZPAC at that point in time. How about the fluoroquinolones? Oral fluoroquinolones. We use fluoroquinolones a lot, don't we? Third generation, fourth generation, the moxifloxacin, gadifloxacin, et cetera, et cetera. We use them a lot topically. And when I'm lecturing live, I say, show of hands, how many of you, you know, use oral fluoroquinolones and very few, if any, hands go up? Oral fluoroquinolones are better for gram negative than they are for gram positive. They will work for gram positive, but they're better for gram negative. Most of the bugs of the eyelids are what? Gram positive. So they're better for gram negative. They were pregnancy category C. So it's kind of risk reward. You got to weigh the pros versus cons with the oral fluoroquinolones. I'm talking Leviquin or Cipro, but they are contraindicated in people under the age of 18 and over the age of 65. The oral fluoroquinolones, there's a black box warning for people under the age of 18 and over the age of 65. You should not prescribe them. And what is that risk, that potential adverse event? tendinitis and tendon ruptures. And I'm sure, again, if we could interact, a lot of you go, yep, tendon. How many of you know a, a loved one, a family member, a patient, or you know of somebody that ruptured their Achilles tendon or had tendinitis or a tendon rupture while on an oral fluoroquinolone? I just don't want to deal with that. I don't want to, you know, fix a preceptal cellulitis and rupture an Achilles tendon. So for that reason, I don't often prescribe oral fluoroquinolones. Pregnancy category C, they're better for gram negative, you know, really hesitate in somebody under the age of 18 or over the 65. They've got to be allergic to pretty much everything else for me to go to the oral fluoroquinolones. Lastly, sulfa, your Bactrim. This is a combination of sulfa methoxazole and trimethoprims. There's actually two different antibiotics in Bactrim double strength. You can see right there, uh, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. So it's got a sulfa in there. So caution in sulfa sensitive patients, but this is your drug of choice. If you ever have to prescribe an oral for MRSA, again, Bactrim is number one oral. Clindamycin is probably number two and doxycycline, hundred milligrams twice a day is number three. Those are your top three oral antibiotics if you ever have to kill MRSA for one reason or the other. Uh, so Bactrim is number one. So with that, that is our oral antibiotic paradigm. Dr. Wu, Steph, I'm going to pause here before we get into our next case. Any questions, comments, thoughts on the oral antibiotics? Let's see here. I'm going to look at the floating. Okay. Is it possible to have relatively good vision and no fever in an orbital cellulitis patient? You know, I, certainly that is possible. Um, uh, when I talk about differentiating, are you, are you, am I, is it okay to, am I, when I talk about orbital cellulitis differentiation, vision is not necessarily on there. You can have patients with poor vision that have preceptal cellulitis, and you can have patients with good vision with orbital cellulitis. Now, usually their vision's down, but is it possible? It is. Now, more often than not, they have a fever, um, but is it possible? Yes. So I would, the fever would be, boy, it'd be unusual to have an orbital cellulitis and no fever, but is it possible? Yes, it is. But use that fever. Um, it's a big differentiator. Are you okay with using Keflex when patient has a penicillin allergy? Again, it depends on what their allergy is. If they said, yeah, I developed a little bit of a rash, uh, you know, maybe I'd consider if I was forced to, but generally speaking, if they have a true penicillin allergy, I would shy away from using Keflex and I would try to use something else. Um, uh, what is the fishing CE in Wisconsin called? Uh, if you send me an email, my email was on the slide or you can email Stephanie, she can pass along to me. Um, it's run by a guy named Dean Springer. He's an optometrist in Wisconsin. Um, he's a great guy. And so that's that one right there. Uh, question for two cases, difference. Differences in treatment of patients allergic to penicillin or sulfa or both. So if they're allergic to penicillin and sulfa, that's when I'm going to consider a Z-pack, depending on the case, or I would consider doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day if it was not contraindicated, or I would consider a second, third, or fourth generation cephalosporin. I know there's some cost involved then, but I would be more likely, that's, that's where I would go down. 
uh, a, a zithromycin. I would try that knowing it's not great at killing staph. So that'd be one option. Um, I would consider um, a third generation, second generation cephalosporin, uh, something like that. So that's how I would handle that one. If Bactrim is MRSA resistant, why didn't it work the first time? Uh, I'm not sure I understand if Bactrim... Bactrim works against MRSA, but it doesn't work 100% of the time. So you may have a case where you tried Bactrim and it was confirmed MRSA and it didn't work. And, you know, it doesn't work 100% of the time. We've had a case or two where clindamycin saved the day. They have what we thought was a MRSA uh, abscess or a MRSA preceptal or hordeolum and Bactrim wasn't working. And sure enough, clindamycin resolved that. So it doesn't work a hundred percent of the time. So that's why you got to have multiple options. Oh, there you go. Why didn't Bactrim help at all prior to the drainage procedure? Good question. And uh, the body has walled off an abscess, you know, an abscess. It, the good news is, is the body's walled it off, what prevents it from spreading. That's the good news. But the bad news is how do you, how do you treat an abscess? An abscess, the treatment of choice is drainage because antibiotics have a hard time getting to a walled off infection. So that's why the Bactrim didn't help because this was an abscess. It had walled itself off and the medication has a trouble uh, getting there. So that was that one right there. What if the patient is allergic to sulfa? Yeah, I think I'm dealing with MRSA and they're allergic to sulfa. Um, again, can't go, go to Bactrim. That's where I would consider clindamycin or doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day. Those are your backups uh, if they're allergic to sulfa. Uh, is bacterial abscess a diagnosis of exclusion? The answer is absolutely yes, it is. Um, did you say later generations of cephalosporin cost more or less? They cost more. So as you go from, you know, Keflex is, I've had it, I've got patients get it for free at our local pharmacies here. Keflex, a first generation, very cost beneficial. As you go to second, third, fourth, fifth generation, the cost is going to get more there. Um, do you recommend ibuprofen for anti-inflammatory discomfort for preceptal cellulitis? Hesitate due to masking a fever. I typically don't, you know, um, I typically don't do that. Usually it's not needed. Could you go to it? I suppose you could, um, but usually the, the, the antibiotic is enough uh, for that. So I usually don't go to ibuprofen, but again, you could uh, with that. Uh, have you ever, would you ever prescribe both a Z-Pack and a doxycycline simultaneously? Interesting question. Um, I never have, I've never done that before. I've done them um, sequentially where are they? I've had them on this and then I put them on that, um, but I've never done that simultaneously before. I think you would want, because then you're just doing the shotgun approach and I would want to know which one is working at that point. So I wouldn't typically do that. Can a CT of the orbit uh, that shows, uh, can CT of the orbit show eyelid identify a potential abscess? It can. It has the potential of doing that. In this particular case, it did not. It did not show an abscess, but a CT does have the potential of, of highlighting an abscess on that. Yes. Uh, in a pediatric preceptal soft tissue lid infection with penicillin allergy and due to age, you can't do doxy or fluoroquinolone. Would azithromycin be your first choice? We've got a pediatric patient. We've got a penicillin allergy. Uh, and you can't do doxy, you can't do a fluoroquinolone. Uh, so yeah, I would, again, I wouldn't go to a penicillin because they're truly allergic. I likely wouldn't go to a first generation cephalosporin. You could consider a later generation cephalosporin. There's no cross reactivity between al allergic to one and allergic to the other. So I would consider either a later generation cephalosporin if cost is not prohibitive, but you also could consider Bactrim. Uh, as well. Bactrim, if they're, unless they're allergic to sulfa, but if they're allergic to sulfa, then I would choose azithromycin. That's exactly right. That's how I would do that. Is, is If you're prescribing a fourth or fifth generation cephalosporin, how would you write that in the script? You would just write the medication. You know, there's, there's a bunch of different medications in the different generations. So you're not going to write fourth generation or fifth generation. You're just going to write the name of the medication and the appropriate dosage there. How to prescribe a higher generation cephalosporin? Does the med have a different name or do you, no, you, you just prescribe, like my daughter was prescribed ceftibutin uh, and I can't remember the dosage, but that's a third generation cephalosporin. So you just got to review which drugs are in the different generations. You don't prescribe the generation, you prescribe the individual drug in each of those categories there. So, all right. I think we got through all of the Q and A's there. See, we have 55 things in the chat box. I don't think I'm going to have time to go through um, all of those. I think many of them those are common. Is kidney or liver 
uh, disease a contraindication for using augmentin? Uh, it depends. Uh, it depends on uh, what type. It depends on what type of. Let me hide this here, so because I know I was blocking that. We're going to hide the floating meeting controls. It depends on obviously the the level of liver disease they have, the lever level of kidney disease. My general rule of thumb is, and this holds for the antivirals as well, is if they are on, if they have significant kidney disease, and what I mean by that is if they have. Um, they're on dialysis, you know, their GFR, their glomerular filtration rate, their creatinine clearance is very reduced. It's less than 20 to 25, meaning they're likely on dialysis. I'm going to run that by their doctor. Then I've had enough experience at this point, working with our doctors within Cherokee nation. If they have chronic kidney disease, but yet their GFR is in the thirties or forties or fifties, they have chronic kidney disease. They do not have a normal GFR, but they're, so their kidney function is reduced, but they're not on dialysis. I'll be okay prescribing an antibiotic for seven days in that case. But if you wanted to run it by their doctor, absolutely. So is it contraindicated? Maybe depending on their level of kidney or liver issues. All right. So we're going to switch gears here. Great questions on the oral antibiotics. Let's keep going um, on the different, our, our next case. So our next case is a 74 year old female that came in. She was light sensitive for the last, you know, about three days. Doctor, boy, I'm just light sensitive in my left eye. Boy, it just, it just hurts in this area. Doctor, right here, just a headache over my left eye hurts in this area. Uh, got a red eye, a light sensitive left eye. And this has been going on for about three days in this 74 year old female. We've got two plus diffuse injection. We've got this irregular pattern on the cornea, which I'm going to show you in just a second, and one to two plus cells in the anterior chamber. So remember that we've got a little mild anterior chamber reaction as well, and this irregular pattern on the cornea. Let me show you a video here. Here is this patient's left cornea, and she was 2060 in this left eye, 2060 in the left eye, and... 2030 in the uninvolved right eye. So right eye is 2030, left eye is 2060. Ignore the two beams. Those are the aiming beams on the YAG laser. We laser anything in Oklahoma, even corneas. We'll just let YAG laser that cornea. I'm kidding. Totally joking on that. Those are the aiming beams of the YAG laser. I promise the laser is off. But you can see this haze. You can see this haze, this edema with this irregular branching type pattern in this 74 year old female. So as you take a look at this, you can certainly understand why she's 2060 in this left eye, this haze, this edema, this irregular branching pattern. What would you wanna put on the cornea to help you assess, to help you evaluate in this 74 year old female? Again, light sensitive red eye for the last three days in her left eye. Let's put some stain in. Yeah, let's put some, some sort of stain in, Rose Bengal, or fluorescein, and you take a look and you go, all right, there's the Rose Bengal. And here's a video of the Rose Bengal. I'll give you a couple of seconds to take a look at this. And you can see this irregular branching pattern, the haze, the edema 2060 in this particular patient. Again, I know we, we can't interact uh, back and forth, but I usually say, is there anything that you would want to do further to assess this patient? Again, we looked at the cornea, we took case history, we put some stain in, and usually one of the answers is corneal sensitivity. Let's take a look at corneal sensitivity absolutely that would be indicated i will tell you in this particular case in this particular case preparacane was put in before i was able to intervene and say we need to test corneal sensitivity so if you test corneal sensitivity post post a preparacane uh don't do that you know it's just not going to give you anything that you want at that point in time and oh by the way i have done that before quick story i was a fourth year uh, extern up at the Mayo Health Clinic with Dr. Leo Scorin. Some of you may know Leo Scorin. He's an ODDO. He's an optometrist and a neuro-ophthalmologist. I was so very fortunate to spend four months with Leo Scorin on a rotation. Man, we saw a ton of disease. And I remember this one time we had a patient with a unilateral red eye and he suspected herpes simplex keratitis. And he said, student, 
He always called you student. Student, go in there and test corneal sensitivity. I went, okay, I'm going to go in there and do that. So I went in the room and I thought to myself, okay, I'm about to poke this patient in the eye. So I better put preparacaine in both eyes. And I went drop, drop in both eyes. And then I got out the dental floss because I usually test corneal sensitivity with dental floss. And I remember testing the normal eye first. I always test the normal eye first. And I test, test, test. I don't don't feel anything over there. And I went to the other eye and test, test, test. They're they're numb in the eye that has a red eye. We suspect herpes simplex. And sure enough, we're seeing that anesthetic effect in the eye involved. But the other eye is not feeling anything either. And I went back to Leo and I said, I think this is herpes simplex, Leo, but I think it's about to go to the other eye. We are going to pick up on an incredible case here of a bilateral case that's about to swing to the other eye, herpes simplex. And he looked at me and said, student, did you put preparacaine in before you did this? And I just hung my head. And I went, yep, I did. And he goes, so don't put preparacaine in before you test corneal sensitivity. In this particular case, one of my students put in preparacaine prior to this. So I'm going to ask you, 74-year-old female, we've got a red light sensitive left eye for the last three days. It just hurts in this area, doc. You saw this irregular branching pattern. You saw that. What's your diagnosis? Based on the clinical presentation and the corneal appearance, what is your diagnosis? Is this herpes simplex dendritic keratitis, herpes zoster pseudodendrites? Is this oral keratopathy, filamentary keratopathy, EKC, or a pseudomonas bacterial ulcer? What is your diagnosis? And I'm going to take a sip of water and I'm going to let these answers come in here. Always interested to see what the response is here. Now, we're, we're in a prescribing orals lecture and we just covered oral antibiotics. So that's, it's very likely it's time for oral antivirals. So probably not oral keratopathy, probably not pseudomonas bacterial ulcer. What do you think here? All right. Love it. Love the answers. Look at that. We are close to split 50-50 with 55% of you thinking herpes simplex dendritic keratitis, about 41% thinking herpes zoster. Love the answers. They're my top two differentials. So when you talk about differential diagnosis, I love the fact that herpes simplex is the number one. You practice long enough and doesn't herpes simplex tend to be our nemesis? There's been times when I have said, this is herpes simplex. And it turns out not to be. There's been other times that herpes simplex wasn't anywhere on my differential. And sure enough, it was herpes simplex. Again, you practice long enough. Herpes simplex is our nemesis. I was trained. I know you were trained as well of probably this saying, any unilateral red eye, you've got to consider herpes simplex keratitis. It may not be the diagnosis, but it needs to be in the differential diagnosis for any unilateral red eye. So I love the fact that this is number one. Again, I've screwed up these cases plenty of times. I had a case a number of years ago. It was a 30-year-old gentleman, and I'll never forget this case. A 30-year-old gentleman, he walks into the exam. He's walking down the hall, and again, he's a 30-year-old male, but he walks down the hall holding his eye, and he's moaning all the way down the hall. Oh, you know, he's in 10 out of 10 pain. And I remember taking a look and evaluating, and when we took a look at his ocular surface, He's got a one millimeter by one millimeter peripheral corneal infiltrate right next to the limbus. In your practice, what is the number one cause of a peripheral corneal infiltrate in your practice? And again, if we were interacting back and forth, I usually hear a couple of answers. What's the number one? It's contact lenses. Contact lens use, overuse, and abuse. Contact lens abuse, sleeping in my lenses in our practice is the number one cause of a peripheral, likely sterile, corneal infiltrate. So contact lens abuse and overuse is number one. What's number two? Staff, staph blepharitis. So our 30-year-old male in the, where he's moaning down the hall, he's got a peripheral corneal infiltrate. He's in 10 out of 10 pain. He's never worn contact lenses before. So he's never worn a contact lens, but he's got grade three staph blepharitis. He's got, he's got bleph caked all over his lashes. So I remember telling the students and residents, we have a hypersensitivity reaction here. We've got a marginal keratitis, a staph blepharitis creating this this sterile infiltrate. And we're going to treat this with lid hygiene and our favorite antibiotic. What's your, I should say our favorite eye drop. What's your favorite eye drop? People say Tobradex, you know, Tobradex, our favorite eye drop. That stuff will grow back a limb, right? Tobradex will grow back a limb there. Um, It's an antibiotic 
and a steroid, as we all know, what are we using the Tobernex more for in that peripheral staph bleph infiltrate? We're using it more for the steroid, the DEX, than we are for the Tobra, uh, the antibiotic. The antibiotic makes us feel better as the doctor, but I put them on Tobernex, put them on lid hygiene, and I said, come back in a few days for follow-up. And I told the students, the resident, and the patient, this is going to clear this up very nicely. But I tell every patient with a red eye, if you have increased redness, if you have increased pain, if you have a drop in vision, if any of those happen, if your eye gets more red, more painful, or your vision drops, you need to come in sooner than the next scheduled follow-up. He comes in unscheduled the next day. And I remember walking in the room, seeing him, he goes, you're back. And he goes, yep, my eye is more red, more painful, and my vision is worse than it was yesterday. Nice job, doc. You brought your A game yesterday, didn't you? When you, when you diagnosed me and I kind of went, ooh, and I took a look in that one millimeter peripheral corneal infiltrate and now had a dendrite over the top of that. So I did the steroid diagnostic test for herpes simplex, and I've probably done it more than any doctor on this call. But how was that herpes simplex? A one millimeter by one millimeter peripheral corneal infiltrate, that should have been contact lens related or staph related. And he had blef, and that was a case of herpes simplex limbitis, herpes simplex marginal keratitis. And I've seen that three times. It's definitely rare. It's not the most common presentation, but that was a case where herpes simplex tricked me up. And ultimately we got to the diagnosis when we needed to, but it just tends to be our nemesis. So I love the fact that herpes simplex is the number one answer in this particular case. Again, I'm not saying it's the right answer, but I love that it's the number one differential. 41% of you put herpes zoster ophthalmicus. And again, if we were interacting back and forth and you can type it in via the chat box, the 41% of you that put herpes zoster ophthalmicus, why did you put herpes zoster ophthalmicus? What factors in the case led you to putting herpes zoster ophthalmicus? And again, I can't see the chat box because I had to hide it because it was blocking some of the slides, but I bet it's age. I often hear it's age. I often hear it's the, the pain. You remember she did this, Doc? It just kind of hurts in this area. Just hurts right here, uh, Doc, in this area. Uh, so she, she's almost saying what? This respects the midline. This respects the dermatoma. It just hurts in this area. So the age, the pain, the achiness, it kind of hurts in this area, Doc. I kind of, it's just a headache right in this area. I got a headache in this area. It's kind of tender in this area. Your next patient that comes in that says, doc, it hurts in this area. What's on your differential? What is on your differential? And you can't miss, everybody always says giant cell arteritis, temporal arteritis, cranial arteritis, three different names for the same condition, giant cell arteritis. You can't miss that. That is a condition that can blind and or kill the patient. So you can't miss this. You got to rule it in or rule it out. What other symptoms do patients have when they've got temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis? What do they usually have? Yeah, they got headache in this temporal area, pain in this temporal area. What else do they usually have? Usually got jaw claudication. The literature shows about 60 to 70% have jaw claudication, and they may not think to mention that to my eye doctor, man, it's kind of been sore when I've been eating, sore when I've been chewing, you know, pain with the jaw movement. So ask about jaw claudication, malaise, fatigue, scalp tenderness, scalp pain, headaches in this area. They may have joint aches. Joint. But what I was most struck with, spending four months with a neuro-ophthalmologist, again, Leo Scorin, he saw giant cell arteritis on almost a weekly basis. And what struck me the most was the lack of energy, the fatigue. I've had no energy over the past few weeks, doc. Just that loss of appetite goes along with that as well. So ask about jaw claudication, ask about malaise, fatigue, lack of energy, lack of appetite, joint achiness, joint stiffness. Our patient had none of that. Okay. In case number one, it hurts in this area. Our patient had none of that. No jaw claudication, no fatigue, no malaise. So we could have ordered a sed rate. We could order a C-reactive protein, but we felt largely comfortable that this was not from giant cell arteritis. So what else can cause the pain, the achiness, the tenderness? Obviously shingles. Herpes zoster ophthalmicus can also cause pain in that area. But if she has shingles, if she has herpes zoster ophthalmicus, shouldn't we have a rash? Shouldn't we see the vesicles uh, right here? And the answer is we usually should. Usually you should, but it's not 100%. The literature says 
85 to 90% of the time, herpes zoster ophthalmicus presents here before it presents here, but that's not 100% of the time. That is not 100%, about 10% of the time, herpes zoster ophthalmicus can present on the globe before it presents here. And it makes the diagnosis more difficult. Your patient that comes in and they've got a, respect, a rash respecting the midline and pain, it's a fairly easy diagnosis of herpes zoster ophthalmicus. When they come in and a cornea looks like this with no rash, it's a little bit more difficult. So is this herpes simplex with a dendrite? Is this herpes zoster with no rash, but we've got a pseudodendrite? So is this a dendrite? Is this a pseudodendrite? There are two ways that you can differentiate a true dendrite from a pseudodendrite. How do we differentiate a true dendrite from a pseudodendrite? This kind of looks like a dendrite, but the age, the pain, could this be a true, a pseudodendrite? A true dendrite has two things that a pseudodendrite does not. A true dendrite has what? Two things. A true dendrite has terminal end bulbs that stain very well with rose bengale, active virus replication, those terminal end bulbs, active virus replication, and they tend to stain very well with rose bengale. So that's number one, a true dendrite from herpes simplex has terminal end bulbs and a true dendrite is often ulcerated. It's eating into the cornea, that herpes simplex virus eating into the cornea. So a true dendrite has terminal end bulbs that stain very well with rose mangel and is often excavated or ulcerated. And the bed of the ulcer will stain with fluorescein or also rose bengal as well. So terminal end bulbs and ulceration. I know you guys can't see this because you don't have a depth perception or elevation behind the slit lamp. But if you were behind the slit lamp, this is actually heaped up. This is elevated. It's not ulcerated or excavated. This is heaped up towards you. This is elevated. That, there's no terminal end bulbs, the age, the pain. This was a pseudodendrite in herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So again, herpes zoster ophthalmicus, pseudodendrites. Here was our treatment. It was valacyclovir, 1,000 milligrams, three times a day for 10 days, a steroid. Do remember that that pseudodendrite is inflammatory in nature. A steroid can be indicated for a pseudodendrite. Would you ever want to put a steroid on a true dendrite in herpes simplex? And the answer is no. That is an active herpes simplex infection and you need antivirals. The pseudodendrite is inflammatory in nature to a certain degree. So you could put them on a steroid, a cycloplegic. Remember our patient had a grade one to two plus anterior chamber reaction. So you could put this patient on a cycloplegic, artificial tears if needed. Again, hematropine, we can't get that anymore. Right now we are limited to cyclopenylate or atropine on the other spectrum. So it's cyclopenylate or it's atropine. Those are our two main options there, but don't forget the cycloplegic in that patient that's got an anterior chamber reaction. So herpes zoster ophthalmicus was the diagnosis. And once again, that was our treatment in this case, number one. So when it comes to herpes zoster ophthalmicus, you know, a lot of people develop shingles every single year, but you may say, yeah, Nate, that's true, but we've got these vaccines now. We've got the Zostavax vaccine that has been around for a number of years. And for about the last five years, we've had the Shingrix vaccine that is showing nice effectiveness and helping to limit the shingles. So shingles is getting less and less and less and less, right? Maybe not. Shingles cases are actually, they've been shown. A lot of people go, no, that when I'm live, you can see people shaking their head going, no, that's that's not true. Shingles cases are, are going up. Why are shingles cases going up? And again, I always pose the question live. You can type it in via the chat box if you so desire. Why are shingles cases going up? Well, age, you know, the boomers are now into their 60s and into their 70s. So we have a big aging population getting into their 60s and 70s into that ripe age for developing shingles. Oh, by the way, where's the number one cause, uh, number one place that people develop shingles? And it's the the trunk, abdomen, back, you know, area. That's the number one place that people develop shingles depending on the source that you look at. Number 2 or number 3 is herpes zoster ophthalmicus. Is our neck of the woods in the ophthalmicus area. So that's number 2 or number 3, but you could develop this anywhere. My grandfather will be 95 years old in just a couple of weeks. He's still on the farm in Flasher, North Dakota. 
And a number of years ago, this is probably three, four, five years ago now, he developed shingles on his left butt cheek. And he was miserable for like a week. He couldn't sit because I can you imagine me having to sit. He, he had to lay on the other side for like a week. So you can develop this anywhere. But the most common location is the torso, back, abdomen area. But we've got this vaccine now. It's getting maybe less and less, but age is contributing stress. Are we a stressed out society? You know, I think Lord, many people would say we are. And then the other interesting factor is chicken pox. I got chicken pox in fifth grade. Do you remember when you got chicken pox or did you get chicken pox as a child? I'm guessing many of you did. My kids, 10 and seven, likely will not get chicken pox. Why is that? Because they were vaccinated for chicken pox, the Verivax vaccine. So now that kids countrywide are not developing chicken pox, is that depriving adults of an, a little immune booster, a little exposure to the virus? When I had chicken pox in fifth grade, I was around my mom and my dad and, and maybe my grandparents and aunts and uncles. And what was I giving them? A little exposure to the virus, maybe in a little immune booster. So now that kids in general are not getting chicken pox, is that depriving adults of that little moon, immune booster? Maybe, maybe not, but between that and age and stress, shingles remains to be a very prominent thing here. So let's take a look. There's chicken pox, the primary infection, contagious, you know, very itchy rash. Uh, as you can see there, most people get vaccinated now. Kids are getting vaccinated. But you remember when you got chicken pox. Any of you have chicken pox parties growing up? Somebody's got chicken pox, bring the kids over. Why, why did you have chicken pox parties? Because you'd rather get chicken pox in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade then get it later than life. So there's your chicken pox. The virus goes dormant and then it reactivates when? When you're stressed, the immune system is lowered for one reason or the other, age, et cetera, et cetera. You know, generally speaking, historically, shingles has been a condition of people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. You know, it's older patients. But again, when I'm live, I usually say, hey, show hands. How many of you have seen a case of shingles in a patient in their 60s, okay? And most of the hands go up. Okay, keep your hand up. How about in their 50s and most of the hands stay up? How about in your 40s and like half of the hands go down, but half of them stay up? How about in your 30s and there's still hands up? How about your 20s and there's still hands going up? So it's getting younger and younger. And again, is it stress? Is it the chicken pox vaccine? It's hard to pinpoint the exact cause, but the point is, don't be surprised if you see herpes zoster ophthalmicus in somebody in their 50s, 40s, or even 30s. Is there anything you need to be concerned about? You know, why did my grandfather develop shingles when he was 90 something years old? Probably because he was 90 something years old. He was 90, 91 at the time. He's now about to turn 95. So again, it lowered immune system. Again, for whatever reason, it was down and the virus reactivated. If your patient is in their 50s or 40s or 30s, is there anything you need to be concerned about? And the answer, generally speaking, is no. Literature shows that still 75 to 80% of shingles cases in young people is still just stress related. So the vast majority of shingles reactivations, whether it's here or whether it's here, is still just stress related. But that's only about 80%. That leaves about 20% that can be from something else. And it reminds me of a case that I saw a while back. It was actually the sister of one of our technicians. And I remember she came in with one of the nastiest cases of herpes zoster ophthalmicus that I've ever seen. She was 41 years old. 41, just a nasty rash, herpes zoster ophthalmicus right here. And I remember talking with our technician and talking with some of our other doctors and debating, should we send her for a systemic workup? She's 41 years old. My general rule of thumb is if they're in their 40s, like kind of 40 and below or 45 and below, we will consider a systemic workup. And we worked her up. We did a chest x-ray. We did all this blood work. We did HIV testing and it all came back negative. It all came back normal at that point in time. And I remember kind of feeling bad that we wasted all of her time as she was getting all this testing for it all came back normal. Because again, 75 to 80% in shingles cases in your young patients is still just stress. It's just stress and, the, and it develops and you'll treat it and it'll go away and no long-term sequelae or no long-term consequences at that point. But you fast forward three months. 
And I remember three, four months later, our technician came in crying and she said, you remember my sister? I said, yeah, I'll never forget her case. And she said she was just diagnosed with breast cancer. And it makes you wonder, was there an association? And ultimately, I don't know whether there was or not, but she had shingles three, four, five months ago, and now she's developed cancer. So is there a link? Maybe, maybe not. But for that reason, if you have a patient in your four, in their 40s or their 30s or their 20s, I think it's sound medicine to let their doctor know, hey, we've got a mutual patient here that's got a case of herpes zoster ophthalmicus. I'm handling it. No issues. But I just wanted to let you know. You know what their doctor is likely going to say? So, you know, they're not going to be like, oh, another 30-year-old or 40-year-old that's got shingles. They're seeing this more and more. So they're likely not going to be concerned, but I would let their primary care physician know in case they want to send them for a workup, blood work, whatever it is, because there can be rare cases. Is it cancer related? Is it immunodeficiency related, HIV, et cetera, et cetera, with that. So again, that's how I handle shingles. You guys all know what Hutchinson sign is. It's a rash in the tip or the side of the nose. It signifies involvement of the external nasal nerve. And if the external nasal nerve is involved, the nasociliary nerve is more likely to be involved. And it brings your chance of globe involvement to close to 80%. Again, if they just have the forehead, Hopefully the globe never becomes involved, but if the nose is involved, the tip of the nose, the side of the nose, really anywhere on the nose, ocular involvement up to 80% of the time, that globe can be involved. Speaking of that globe, what can be involved in herpes zoster? And the answer is pretty much anything that ends in itis. When it comes to the eye, anything that ends in itis, conjunctivitis, keratitis, episcleritis, scleritis, iritis, retinitis, choroiditis, optic neuritis, pretty much anything that ends in itis, but the most common globe involvement likely, depending on the source, is an anterior uveitis, an iritis. You want to pay attention to this short term and pay attention to this long term as well when it comes to the iritis. Most often when patients have an acute unilateral red eye with an iritis, the pressure, the IOP is usually what? It's usually lower. In cases of herpes simplex and herpes zoster, the pressure can actually be higher. So if you ever see a patient with a unilateral red eye, an acute unilateral red eye, they've got an anterior chamber reaction, they've got an anterior uveitis and iritis, and the pressure is higher, three, four, five, six, ten 10 points or more higher, herpes simplex and herpes zoster should rise in your differential diagnosis and you more strongly consider them. All right. In our last five minutes here, five to seven minutes before we get to more questions, what is your medication of choice when treating herpes, zoster, ophthalmicus? Let's talk the oral antivirals for the next five to 10 minutes before we finish here. Let's say you use tomorrow, you see a patient, standard herpes, zoster, ophthalmicus. They've got a rash. It's been going on for about two days, doc. I felt some tingling, some pain, and I've got some vesicular eruption here. Um, so it's been going on for about 48 hours. So we've got a standard case. The globe is not involved at this point, but a standard case of herpes zoster ophthalmicus. What would you start the patient on? Acyclovir, valacyclovir, famcyclovir, or Zergan? Let's pull all of you guys, what is standard of care on this webinar? Let's see what the options are. We got multiple dosages for each medication. Why do we have multiple dosages? One is for herpes simplex. One is for herpes zoster. If you know the dosage for herpes simplex, how do you get to zoster? You double it. If you know it for zoster, you have it to get to simplex. And in the, what's standard here? All right, there you can see what your colleagues are treating with. Number one answer by far. More than double the next most common is valacyclovir, 1,000 milligrams three times a day. Acyclovir, the next 800 milligrams five times a day. What are the correct answers? It's B, D, and F. B, D, and F are your correct answers. Again, double the dose for herpes zoster ophthalmicus. So let's talk on the oral virals for a few minutes. Oral antivirals are incredibly safe medications. Pregnancy category B, back in the day when they did pregnancy category, so very safe medications in terms of pregnancy. Very safe overall, other than an end stage kidney disease. Other than that, there's really no major complications for the most part when it comes to the oral antivirals. Acyclovir, valacyclovir, famcyclovir, very safe medications. You can see the dosages here for herpes zoster ophthalmicus. Again, you half the, the milligrams for herpes simplex. So when it comes to zoster, 
acyclovir, 800 milligrams, five times a day. Valet cyclovir, 1,000 milligrams, three times a day. Or fam cyclovir, 500 milligrams, three times a day. Your favorite is valet cyclovir. My favorite is valet cyclovir as well. But acyclovir has been the historic standard. It was number one for a long time. Why is that? Cost. It was the first one that was generic. It had the, it was the cheapest medication. So for a long time, acyclovir was the standard, but valet cyclovir has largely taken over. Why is that? Well, before I get there, I forgot to mention, I want to highlight this 72 hour window. The literature long standing has said, if you can get your patient on oral antivirals within the first 72 hours, they tend to do better than if they're on oral antivirals after that or outside that 72 hour window. So that first three days is critical. The sooner that you can get them on oral antivirals, the better. But there's about four advantages to valet cyclovir and fam cyclovir over a cyclovir. What are those four advantages? Well, number one, it's obvious. You can see it right in the screen. Number one's a better dosing schedule. I would rather take a pill three times a day compared to five times a day. So number one is a better dosing schedule for valet cyclovir and fam cyclovir. Number two, they're pro drugs. The body utilizes them. They're actually converted to acyclovir inside the body. The body utilizes them a bit better. Depending on the study that you look at, they're 25 to 80% more bioavailable. The body utilizes them better. So that's reason number two. So better dosing schedule, more bioavailable. Number three goes back to that 72-hour window. Studies have shown that they are better outside the 72-hour window. So if you ever have a patient that presents on a Friday and says, Doc, this started Monday. I just couldn't come in. I thought this would get better. It didn't. It's harvest season. You know, I've been on the combine. I've been on the tractor, whatever it is. It started Monday, my symptoms, and now it's Friday. They are 96 hours in. They're four days in. They're outside the 72-hour windows. The literature guides us that on patients outside the 72-hour window, you really want to go to valet cyclovir or fam cyclovir. So that's reason number three. And reason number four is they have a lower incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia. Some studies indicate about 30% lower incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia for fam cyclovir and valet cyclovir, about a 30% lower incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia. So for those four reasons, better dosing schedule, more bioavailable, better outside the 72 hour window and a lower incidence of poster pedic neuralgia. Those are the reasons why valet cyclovir are your number one and is my number one as well. Nice options that are very, very safe for the vast majority. The only major contraindication is severe kidney disease. And again, it goes back to unless they're on dialysis, using an antiviral for a week in a patient with chronic kidney disease, not end-stage kidney disease, but chronic kidney disease. I've had multiple conversations with multiple doctors in Cherokee Nation. Uh, one of my good friends, Doug Nolan, I remember having a conversation. Hey, we've got a patient. They've got a GFR about 30. They're not on dialysis. I need to prescribe an oral antiviral for a week. And him going, you'll be fine for a week. Unless they're on end-stage disease dialysis, you're likely going to be okay uh, in these patients here. Just a couple of tidbits in my last two or three minutes. If you ever have a lactose intolerant patient, the recommendation of choice is valet cyclovir. Valet cyclovir is lactose free. There are some versions of acyclovir that are eight that are lactose free, but not all versions of acyclovir are lactose free. So um, valet cyclovir is your um, is your your drug of choice for um, your generic oral antivirals. So there you go with that. Um, pediatric patients, these are very safe and they've been established in pediatric patients. Um, valet cyclovir two and under a cyclovir down to neonates, fam cyclovir tend to shy away from because you can see the information there, but valet cyclovir and a cyclovir safe really for two and above and a cyclovir down to neonates. So there you go with that. Uh, childbearing age, again, we talked about pregnancy category B. Um, so there's, there's really a, a safe for women of childbearing age, acyclovir uh, and valet cyclovir. So there we go. And, and that one, how about the kidney stuff? Here's your renal dosing. If you ever have to adjust this again, I would let their doctor uh, adjust their renal dosing, but you can see the bottom line. You're at a normal dosage, you know, unless their GFR is less than 25, you know, unless it's really 20, less than 25, you're probably going to be at a relatively normal dose for acyclovir uh, and valet cyclovir. Again, really only if it's less than about 25, will you adjust that? Again, I would have a conversation with their doctor. Our patient, our mutual patient has kidney issues. I need to treat their herpes simplex or their herpes zoster, whatever it is, uh, and you do that. Pediatric dose. 
Uh, if you ever have to go to the syrup, it's 12 to 80 milligrams per kilogram per day. That's a wide dose. Let me narrow it for you. 30 milligrams per kilogram per day. Obviously, you're dosing that based on weight, uh, things like that. Recurrences, 12 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day uh, when it comes to that. So there's our, our head studies have looked at this. I'm going to skip through the head studies uh, when it comes to that. And I'm going to finish. I think we've covered everything with the oral antivirals again. I'll leave up the pediatric dose uh, here, uh, and I'm going to open up for any questions as we are nearly at 11.45. So let me hit this, and we will open up. Okay, we've got age. In particular, she's in the age group getting the zoster vaccine. I see a lot of patients with mild zoster on their skin, um, if not mild after a week of the zoster vaccine. So just a comment there. Uh, and just adding to that before I get back to the questions, you know, the current the current recommendation for zoster vaccination for Shingrix is what age? And the answer is greater than 50. The answer is greater than 50 in this particular case. It used to be greater than 60 for Zostavax, but now it's greater than 50. So yes, anybody over the 50, they are now recommending getting the Shingrix vaccine for zoster uh, vaccination. Let's see. What else. Can Bactrim be used in pregnant women? Bactrim is preg was pregnancy category C. So it's not pregnancy category D like doxycycline. It's a strong no in, for doxycycline unless it was like vision threatening and we had nothing else or, you know, life threatening and you had nothing else. Bactrim was pregnancy category C. So B is friendly. You can you can use it. You know, that should be no issues with pregnancy category B. Pregnancy category C, it was really kind of risk reward. You know, you could go either way on that. There's no great studies that say one way or the other. So could you use it? You can, but you need to educate on the risks when it comes to Bactrim. So that was our oral antibiotic question. Recommendations on taking IOP with Goldman in the presence of a dendrite. Should there be a concern for worsening the dendrite? Good question. Um, you know, I think in that particular case, you could eye care. You know, you don't have to, to measure it with Goldman. You could do eye care. You could do tonal pen, uh, things like that. But, you know, I don't know that you would, you know, drastically worsen uh, a dendrite by doing Goldman, obviously being gentle uh, with that. I would try to use other instruments uh, but if you had no other instruments, I would be okay with taking Goldman and wouldn't have any drastic concern of, of worsening the dendrite because if I'm seeing them and checking their pressure, I'm about to knock out the dendrite with Zergan or an oral antiviral as well. So uh, do you dilate all of your zoster patients? Or are there certain signs that prompt you to dilate only certain uh, zoster patients? My rule is when they come in with a zoster, uh, I will dilate them. I will just, uh, that's my opportunity because zoster can cause so many things from an optic neuritis to, you know, it can cause retinal issues. It, it can have inflammation. I mean, most common is an iritis. I want to take a look. Is there an iritis? What does it look like behind the lens? Things like that. So my standard on day of diagnosis is I like to dilate them unless for some reason we can't, and I will dilate them on an early follow-up. So yes, I dilate them uh, for those zoster patients. Uh, do you dilate all of your patients the same day as the walk-in or do you wait for them to use the cycloplegic, be less light sensitive? And again, that if, if, we're, if they're super light sensitive, like I said, I just, for one reason or another, I can't get a view. We, I mean, we're going to dilate them with the cycloplegic likely. Um, but if they just had the rash on the forehead and no globe involvement, you know, I, I still think it's sound practice, but again, I'm at a school, so I'm teaching students and I'm teaching residents um, so I typically dilate them again. If we can't, I'll bring them back in when they come in dilated on the cycloplegic as well. So there's lots of different ways you can do that. Is, is Zergan unnecessary when oral is used? That's the advice of the corneal specialist in my office. I, I would agree with that. Um, the literature says topical or oral, I'm assuming you're talking herpes simplex. So with herpes simplex, when you've got a dendrite on the cornea, the literature says one or the other topical or oral, you don't need both. Now, in a perfect world, if it was my eye and the medications were free, I would want both. I would want Zergan, so we are wiping out that virus right on the ocular surface, that dendrite, and I would want an oral because herpes simplex, that is truly a systemic disease. That is a systemic virus. It's reactivated. We all know the most common place it reactivates, the cold sores but that's truly a systemic disease. So in a perfect world, 
I would want an oral to shut down the virus systemically, as well as Zergan to shut, you know, to wipe out that dendrite on the cornea. But again, what are the problems with Zergan? The cost and the availability. In my system, Zergan is free for our patients and the oral is free. So my standard for herpes simplex is I put them on a topical and an oral. However, I agree with your corneal specialist. I'm going against the literature on that um, because it's free. Um, you only need, you need one or the other. So is, is Zergan un unnecessary when an oral is used? The answer is yes, according to the literature. But in a perfect world, I would want that as well. So, all right. So let me see. I think with that, um, doo -doo -doo, I think we've got, how often do you have zoster without ocular involvement with just the... How often do you have zoster without ocular involvement, but just the skin? Yeah, more often than not, the vast majority, 80 to 90% of the time, you know, herpes zoster ophthalmicus has got the skin involvement um, without the globe involvement. But again, if they develop it on their nose, now they're much more likely. So the majority, thankfully, is just here. Um, so with that, Dr. Wu, Steph, I think we've got most of the questions there. Um, and I'm going to kick it back to you. I think we're out of time.